Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Big Picture Film Club podcast. Today we are joined by British Urban Film Festival founder and MBE recipient, Emmanuel Enyam Asigwe. Uh, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess one of the reasons um, I, I wanted to invite you on to have a chat was actually like manifold, um, and um, it's really, uh, particularly in this last year, um, it's really interesting to see what the British Urban Film Festival is sort of doing and pushing towards, and I think it's a very interesting time in our industry um, where, you know, we've kind of had, I would say, you know, in the last five years, like a particular crop of exhibitors and um, kind of pop up in terms of promoting independent films, in terms of promoting kind of black films. Um, and to think, looking at it now, that all right, the what you founded was 15 years ago. That's uh, some time away. And so kind of looking back at the, the, the legacy and the start of the British Urban Film Festival, I'm very keen to know what well, for the audience is that people that don't know, one, what is the British Urban Film Festival and how was that environment creating it uh, back in, you know, 15 years ago in 2005? How, how, how was the landscape then for independent film, for black film? Well, f from a personal point of view, um, I've been driven by a lot of circumstances and luck, most of which I've made my own way. And then obviously the harder you work, the luckier you get. So it's a combination of different types of luck and circumstances. And what I mean by that, if I start with my own personal background, so born to Nigerian parents, um, on my dad's side of the family, the Anyam Usigwe family, um, my first cousin, Peace, is the founder of the African Movie Academy Awards, otherwise known as the Amers. And her brother, Charles, was one of the first children's television presenters on NTA, which is the state broadcaster in Nigeria. So that's essentially the bloodline as to where I kind of come into this. Um, mm. And I've actually got another um, first cousin, Darlington, who's entered the film business with his debut feature called Cold Feet, which you can watch on Netflix. So again, he's from my dad's side of the family. So that's, that's the bloodline in terms of what we're all kind of doing. Um, so I've always had that, not to fall back on, but just to understand that there are people that have gone before me hmm. that have just as much passion and creativity and innovation to create what they've created. Um, and in the case of peace, obviously the Amers is Africa's answer to the Oscars. And Africa being the massive continent that it is, there's no reason why we shouldn't have our own Oscars and to that extent, our own infrastructure as a film industry. But that's for another discussion. But that's essentially my family. So you throw that circumstance with my university degree, which I got from Thames Valley University, which is now the University of West London. So for those that don't know the geography of London, the UWL is five minutes away from Ealing Studios, which is the world famous production studio. So um, as far as I know, it's the world's oldest continuously running production studios. So obviously a lot of films and TV programs are shot on those premises. And that's where my university happened to be. So you have that, as a place to kind of learn the history of British film in particular. Mm. And obviously just re-emphasizes the passion as to why I wanted to do film and television in the first place. So that's where I got my degree from. So you have that as well. But then as a child, um, again, bringing it back to family, I was rebellious looking back because as the son of Nigerian parents, telling them that you want to do film and television is just not heard of. Um, you're either going to be a blue collar or a white collar person, doctor, lawyer, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But I guess from a child watching television from a very young age, and in particular commercial television, um, ITV in those days, as well, I've got a natural kind of passion and appreciation of what it meant to be proud of your content. And when I say pr uh, proud, I guess I'm referring to the ident. So I'm going into geek mode here. So 
in the old days in ITV, depending on which part of the country you lived in, you had your own ITV station. Mm-hmm. So in London, you would have Thames Television, London Weekend Television. In the Midlands, you'd have Central. In, in Norwich, East Anglia, you'd have Anglia Television, Scottish, etc., etc., etc. So before each and every programme would go to where they would have their ident, which obviously all brands have, um, especially in media, where before a program starts, you see a five, 10 second little animated movie with a voiceover or a logo or an emblem or whatever it was to represent what that brand was and is. Mm-hmm. So for me, when I was watching this as a child through LWT and Thames, and then you then watch the program, it just further cemented the fact that you're watching quality television but also the way it was presented was of a standard as well and that's what I took forward um, into later years in anything that I did from a creative point of view whether it was um, the student magazine uh, radio program all these things I did at university and college and then obviously when I set up Buff whilst at university um, coming up with that name was so important because it had to define what it is I wanted to contribute and bring to society and culture Mm -hmm. Um, and that brings me to another part of the circumstances and the luck that I've had the fortune to be part of so after I graduated from Thames Valley University I took on a summer job at Black Filmmaker Magazine and now for those that don't know um, Black Filmmaker Magazine because it's no longer in um, circulation this was a bi-monthly print magazine which was edited and founded by Menelik Shabazz. Um, now, for those of a certain age, Menelik Shabazz was one of the very first black British filmmakers to theatrically release a film or even make a film. And that film was Burning an Illusion in 1981. Um, so how we came to create the magazine was having returned from the Cannes Film Festival in the late 90s. He then realised that the UK did not have a black film magazine or a print journal of any description reporting and documenting black film whether in the UK or globally and that's when the magazine idea became um, reality in the late 90s which he set up alongside um, Charles Thompson who's also an MBE and who later went on to found the Screen Nation Film and TV Awards so this is where I had my summer job after graduating from university And it's from there that I kind of developed my skill sets, my re-education and love for black film, which then kind of um, reformed itself into Buff, which I set up in 2005, having attended the Princess Trust Urban Music Festival back then in Oscorp. And then the idea from a music festival then became a film festival. So that's where Buff kind of got its name from and its concept in terms of a white guy, Prince Charles, kind of mobilising thousands of black people um, in the music sphere. And then I thought, well, why can't a black person kind of generate that black sphere in the film and TV context? And that's mm-hmm. where Urban Music Festival then became Urban Film Festival, and we'll put B at the end, for it to become Buff. So that's basically all my circumstances um, which have led to how Buff was founded 15 years ago in terms of the people that have been in my life. Um, obviously, my parents, um, who brought me on the earth, are no longer here, but mm. obviously they, they've left quite a legacy in itself. Uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating story. Um, it seems that you're, um, you know, you kind of mentioned that, the, like, the different brand idents of... Um, ITV, and it seems that you're very, um, if this would be fair to say, kind of what you're taking up by is not only seeing that sort of the film and television, but the mechanics of how that was brought to life. Would that would that be fair to fair to say? Yeah, in terms of the mechanics, I mean, that, I guess that's where the festival comes into it because curation is mm-hmm. kind of um, what Buff is known for more then the branding, but obviously the branding is very important because Mm -hmm. that's where we get a lot of our following, especially online. But when we had the festival year in, year out at cinemas and venues across the country, again, that branding was very prominent. But in answer to your question about the mechanics, um, the branding obviously played a very early part in developing that reputation for Buff. 
because when I set up Buff, um, there wasn't anything in the UK that was catering for black film, um, bar BFM, which I was part of. So obviously mm -hmm. I knew behind the scenes what it took to put an event on like a black film festival, um, let alone a magazine. And this is what Big BFM had done for the best part of 13 years. So they set up their magazine in 98. First festival was in 99, and then that ran until about 2010. Um, and then obviously Buff started in 2005. So there was an overlap of about five years. But obviously having amassed that skill set and experience at the BFM, I obviously just took those, transferred it to Buff and then kind of put my own kind of imprint as to how I wanted Buff to be represented mm -hmm. from a branding point of view. And then through the films, how I wanted to represent the filmmakers because obviously without the filmmakers, you don't have that product of a mm -hmm. film festival. And without the film festivals, you can't really tell any story or narrative whatsoever. So the fact that I was in that position 15 years ago to bring black filmmakers to the Buff platform and promise them um, a platform, first and foremost, where their films could be shown to the public um, without any scrutiny. And those films would be then appreciated either by the audience or by the press, distributors, whoever was watching or whoever felt that they could benefit from being immersed in black film. Now, obviously, this is a discussion that people are only starting to have now and appreciate, whereas 15 years ago, that attention to detail about putting black filmmakers first was the reason why I believe that Buff was going to leave such a legacy um, all those years ago. So it was very important to be on top of all of the mechanics, whether it's the branding, the film curation, the story behind the film. Mm -hmm. So obviously all filmmakers have got their own stories as to how a film was being put together. So you've got all of that as well. Um, so it's it's a it's a juggernaut. It's safe to say. Obviously, 15 years on, all those elements are still in play now. And obviously, with the pandemic, we're constantly being challenged to make sure that we retain that offering and we retain those elements. Because without those elements, um, that passion that people see from the outside um, will no longer be there. So it's very important that. Um, the inner drive that I have rubs off on everyone that gets involved in the buff process. And does that, um, uh, you, with buff, you've also kind of set up um, buff originals, um, your sort of, I guess, distribution arm of the company. Um, what was the, how's that looking like? And I guess, what was the thought process behind that? So the buff originals concept was born out of, um, remaining relevant. So in 2018, it became apparent in the film and TV industry that diversity was becoming um, the buzzword and that mm. organisations had to adapt. They had to embrace diversity, inclusion, representation, both on screen and off screen. Obviously, Buff had nothing to worry about because we were already kind of on that road long, long time ago. So we were kind of asking ourselves, how do we remain relevant um, if everyone is now jumping on our on our lawn with regards to diversity? So in 2018, Netflix were in their peak, I guess, um, as a streamer with their original content um, and also starting to cater for black audiences um, and just reflecting the black experience through their talent acquisitions, whether it be through actors, or through um, CEOs, COOs, uh, marketing execs, whatever you want to call it, Netflix was starting to embrace mm -hmm. um, the importance of diversity in their offering. So for Buff, it was an easy decision to kind of not mirror what Netflix was doing, but just simply do something that we hadn't done before. And it was obvious to me that having curated and exhibited films for over a decade, the only thing that I hadn't done was actually make a film. So that's why we set up the Buff Originals concept uh, to actually make films. And that is the reason why I entered um, the film business in the first place. I always wanted to make films. I always wanted to be a Steven Spielberg a director. But I guess once I took on that summer job at BFM, the kind of bug for producing, for fixing, for organising took over at the expense of the directing. Um, but I guess in many ways that fortune 
reared itself again in the form of my wife, Claire, um, who I met in 2014 um, and who in 2017, um, after she packed up her skincare business, for which she was honoured for by the Queen, then decided to go into film. And so she wrote a screenplay about her experiences as a dermatologist, mm. which is the kind of main storyline in No Shade. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of really how that film became the first project under the Buff Originals brand. When we released it, of course, we had no idea that the issue of a dark-skinned cast in Black Panther was going to be topical. And neither did we factor in um, the release of a book by Beyonce's father, Matthew Knowles, uh, mm. who thought that Beyonce's mum was white. So you had all those things happening and our film. Um, and really, we kind of struck black oil, pardon the pun, in terms of mm -hmm. getting the word out there about a film and a subject matter, which obviously is not easy on the eye, colorism. It's one of those discussions that we're still having now where we're literally airing out our dirty laundry uh, mm. because of the connotations and the history of colorism which obviously have been rooted in slavery but have now been um, showing itself in other forms of our society and culture. Um, and on that point uh, you touched on uh, I guess companies being more aware or like diversity and sort of inclusion being a, a sort of a buzz word um do you think um do you think this sort of discussion that's kind of happening now around those sort of terms is will lead to sort of tangible changes that we can see or do you think that you know do you even think something like diversity quotas help or don't help um or is this a, sort of something that will unfortunately pass and this moment will sort of pass and not lead to real tangible change? Well, it, it depends who you see um, as the gatekeepers, the people that have the power to make these things tangible. Mm -hmm. um, for someone like me who set up my own film festival, I see myself as a gatekeeper. And what I mean by that is that I'm not seeking for permission from the status quo. Um, so obviously by the status quo, I guess I mean by default, white companies, white organisations for whom these issues have suddenly become um, issues that they were not aware of before, um, i.e. being ignorant to the mm -hmm. uh, issue, or they've just disregarded the issue in that it's not important, it doesn't affect their bottom line, but because of what's happened this year, especially with the death of George Floyd, which seemed to have kick-started this discussion, um, white organisations have decided to embrace um, the black experience on screen and off screen. Um, whether that's been done financially or culturally is a matter for these organisations. But clearly from what I have experienced and what I'm seeing, uh, this is only the beginning. So I'd like to think that now that Black History Month is out of the way, that that energy um, and that attitude um, remains in place all the remaining months of this year and obviously all of next year and however long uh, this will continue because as Noel Clark said um, at our Buff Awards last year when he received the honorary award, um, hopefully there won't be any need for Buff in the future. But until then, obviously we need to keep doing what we're doing um, not to keep the pressure up on these organisations, because like I said, I see myself as my own gate gatekeeper. Um, I'm not appeasing anybody whatsoever. But what I am doing through the festival is opening it up to filmmakers and audiences who feel just as marginalised as black people. Um, so obviously in white organisations, they would see black people as the most marginalised uh, people. But obviously there are white people that are marginalised as well. And those are people that we embrace as part of the festival, whether that be um, the traveller community, the LGBT community, um, students, youth, the disabled, um, all those groups that come under the protected characteristics by law. Um, that's kind of really who we look out for um, on a consistent basis. And that's reflected in the partners that we work with at the festival, the Iris Prize, um, which are an LGBT festival based in Cardiff. We're partners with them. 
Um, and obviously now this year, we were a BAFTA accredited festival. Um, and that was a story in itself. And it wasn't something that I was seeking. Neither mm. was I seeking the MBE. But the fact that all these things have happened in the 15th year of BAF is something, like I say, is down to hard work, um, dedication to the cause. And as I said at the beginning, a lot of luck. Um, how did that? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I really do. One of the things I did want to talk about is that you did become like a BAFTA uh, qualifying organization this year um and how did that who called who how did, how does that happen for a film festival um well it's pretty and what does that mean for buff sure um so two-part question so what it means for buff um ultimately is it allows because of that BAFTA tag to um get more submissions into the festival um so obviously for film festivals around the world, um, submissions is the lifeblood. Um, it's kind of the single most um, important piece of uh, income that you'll get. So we'd like to think now that we've got that BAFTA tag, that we're going to get thousands of submissions, not just from the UK, but around the world. And obviously now with the pandemic, it is easier than ever to submit films online through Film Freeway, um, which is an online submissions platform for which we are gold recognized um, and gold recognized basically means that that entitles filmmakers to certain discounts and privileges um, mm. if they submit their films to buff via film freeway so not only are we BAFTA accredited which is more visible to attract more submissions we're gold registered on film freeway which is the leading online submissions platform in the world um, we also are BIFA qualifying um, which is the British Independent Film Awards which recognises British independent film, and obviously Buff by default um, celebrates independent film. So we have that status as well. So that's more visibility for the filmmakers and more recognition for their work. So obviously that's that's reflected in our submission fee, um, which we put out every year, and that in turn attracts the submissions. But how we got the accreditation in the first place, like I said, was a story in itself. So for those that have been following Buff throughout the year. What happened at the height of George Floyd was um, what's been called performative solidarity, uh, which is basically white organisations jumping on the bandwagon um, and standing in solidarity with black people. And literally in the week following George Floyd's death, um, you could have lost count with a number of white organisations falling over themselves to say mm -hmm. that they stood in solidarity with black people. And one of those organisations was BAFTA. And so having seen uh, that tweet um, online, um, it wasn't kind of part of me to kind of get involved in those kinds of campaigns or causes. Because for me, my glass is always half full with the festival. So I have no reason to be part of these campaigns. And that's not because I have a cold attitude to these things. Obviously, as black people, we, we, we have feelings about these things, but there's only so much that we can say and do if we want to affect change. So it was on that basis that I got involved uh, when BAFTA put out this tweet about George Floyd. But I was able to back it up because the reason why I called out BAFTA was because two years ago in 2018, um, one of my friends in the industry, Victor Adiboden, um, passed away very suddenly at the age of 33. And for someone like me who is very paranoid about a lot of things, I actually Google British Urban Film Festival every single day just to see mm. who's talking about the festival. And on one such occasion, I saw BAFTA's name come up on the Google search. So obviously I was inquisitive, looked into it, and I realised that they had published an obituary that I had written personally about Victor, which was published in the Voice newspaper um, in April 2018. So which I was surprised because one, I wasn't approached, I wasn't mm -hmm. told or notified that this had actually happened and that this was on BAFTA's pages. But also what they also did was they thought that Victor was the CEO of the British Urban Film Festival. So they actually conflated the two of us and obviously you have that um, kind of uh, misconception of all black people looking the same. Yeah. So you've got all these things happening. Um, and obviously I call that BAFTA. Um, they apologized two years ago when I realised that they had published the obituary without permission, apparently there was some standard practice which happened with obituaries whereby they were allowed to um, kind of take 
pieces that have been put out in the public in domain, especially obituaries. Okay. But lo and behold, the Voice newspaper didn't know about this either. So you had that going on. So they apologised two years ago. I was dissuaded from pursuing legal action. And then two years later, when BAFTA put out this tweet about showing solidarity, I called them out. Mm-hmm. And then obviously I brought out the receipts. So mm-hmm. I published the screen grabs of the mistakes that they made because otherwise people would think I was mad. Um, like I said, I'm not a person that usually calls out people. So when people suddenly saw the evidence put in front of them, uh, BAFTA reached out to me, The Voice reached out to me, uh, Evening Standard reached out to me, various um, organisations reached out to me just to try and get to the bottom of the story. Um, and to that day, BAFTA have obviously been in contact with me and were obviously wiping the slate clean. Um, the new person who's the chair of BAFTA, the first person of colour, incidentally, and um, this was his first kind of item in his entry. Mm-hmm. So obviously he dealt with it um, as swiftly as possible, to his credit, um, and he asked us um, to get involved in the BAFTA infrastructure, for want of a better phrase. So we've been approached to become members of BAFTA. He asked us about um, accreditation. We knew about the accreditation because of other film festivals that we knew had the accreditation as well. Yeah. And we thought that there was a secret process to it. There isn't actually a secret mm-hmm. process. It's, it's just the fact that Buff has something that is very unique in that it's a regular black film festival of which there's not that many in the UK. And given what BAFTA have encountered this year in terms of not acknowledging black talent in their film awards categories, mm-hmm. uh, it made sense for them to have Buff under the BAFTA umbrella. Um, But other black organisations, as it turned out, have also received that accreditation this year. So I'd like to think that because of the action that we took in the summer, Mm -hmm. that it's now kind of spurred on people at BAFTA to embrace other black film organisations. So I guess in that moment, BAF does make people sit up and take notice that we as a people have something of value to offer. Um, and I wanted to kind of pivot just slightly um, as a as a business owner and as a an entrepreneur. Um, I guess how what are the key pieces of advice you could give in terms of uh, keeping your business afloat, uh, particularly one, particularly that you're based in the arts, which is having a rough ride at the moment and you've kind of gone for 15 years i'm sure there's been sort of like rocky roads and ups and downs with it um how have you managed to kind of keep the ship afloat as it were so like i said there's a lot of luck involved but you have to work hard to earn that luck and when it comes your way you've got to be in a position to channel it in the right direction and make the right choices um With Buff, when we were setting it up, um, I kind of soon realised that the public funding was not there and not sustainable um, to kind of uh, channel the vision that I saw for the festival, Mm -hmm. because I think very high. So the money that was available was not enough to really foster that vision that I had for the festival. So it was on that basis that I remortgaged the family home Um, unbeknown to my parents for six years so they put my name on the house deeds Mm -hmm. and by doing that I was able to then remortgage the house and obviously max out as many credit cards and loans as you can think of Mm -hmm. without telling them because as I said earlier um, the son of Nigerian parents does not do film and television so obviously (laughs) I had a lot to prove not just to myself but to my parents and obviously to people out there who also thought that black film was not commercial. Um, Mm -hmm. These are issues that the industry are now having to address. And this is something that I was thinking 15 years ago. It just doesn't make sense, you know, to not acknowledge black film for what it was worth. But I had to back myself because I couldn't rely on the industry to give me the money or the will to say, we believe you, we trust you to push this vision. So I had to back myself ultimately And because I was in that position to remortgage the family home, I obviously did that. Um, And then it got to a stage whereby I had to tell my parents where all the money was going because they Mm -hmm. thought 
I had a double life or I had a family on the side. They, they were just as paranoid as me. So when I told them, <laughs> when I told them where the money was going, um, they kind of said that they will support me um, and it became a family business. Um, obviously, they've now they've not lived long enough to see where Buffer's reached. Um, now in its 15th year, um, they passed away um, in the last seven years. But obviously what they've left behind is a child who's just hysterically opportunist um, about black film in particular, but also film and TV in general, because it's one of the very few industries that are in a position to adapt now that we have this pandemic. And now with the, the lockdown, the second lockdown um, upon us, um, again, the film and TV industry is being asked to adapt or die because yeah. um, compared to the airline industry, there's not room for flexibility. Um, and we're very fortunate that we have home entertainment to fall back on, that we have the copious amounts of TV channels, podcasts, radio stations, websites, blogs, whatever you want to call it. We have all this at our disposal. So there's loads of opportunities for content creators to be original and to offer something to its audience. And for Buff, um, we're just simply rising to the challenge and meeting that challenge head on um, with our upcoming festival this year. So there's always a lot to look forward to um, in the buff world. And as I said earlier, my glass is always half full in terms of staying relevant and just kind of staying commercially um, active, um, reflecting what's happening in the industry and where you sit within that. Like I said, what we've done over the past 15 years and what I have done personally prior to that has mm. got us into a position this year where we essentially don't have anything to worry about, but we've still got to remind people um, what Buff is, what it represents, why it's important, and we'd like to think that the audiences will reflect that um, when they come online and be part of the festival um, in a matter of weeks. Uh, Emmanuel and Yam Asigwe. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, it's a lot of jewels have been dropped. Uh, a lot of knowledge has been gained. Uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure talking with you. And where, just lastly, where can people kind of check out uh, the British Urban Film Festival and uh, if they want to submit, if they want to watch films or, and find out dates of programming, where can they go? Sure. So we're kind of working... Um round the clock behind the scenes just to get ready for the festival this year. So just stay in touch via the website British Urban Film Festival .co .uk. Um, If you visit our YouTube channel, um, you can see loads of videos, short films and interviews that our team have been doing over the past 12 months. On Instagram and Twitter, we share the same handle, which is Buff Connects. And you're able to stay in touch with all the updates that are coming in from our various Buff alumni and also with what's happening with the festival um, in-house. So there's lots going on online, but um, over the next few weeks, we'll be starting to make our landmark announcements about the festival this year. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for your time once again. Thanks for having me. Cheers.